thank you very much. If you get a scent of sweet cherries wafting over you, brace yourself. Um, now, as, as you said there rightly, it is uh, you know, lots going on in the news. This is the week uh, of a Tory leadership election. Boris Johnson, it seems, is about to become uh, our next prime minister. So what better time to talk about lies and the war on truth? <laughs> and of course, there is, thank you. <clears throat> And, and, and there is so much we could say just on that topic alone about him. It's, uh, somebody has a very rare distinction, actually, of having been fired twice for lying, in his case. Um, but there's so much else we could say about, in some ways, his counterpart across the Atlantic, about Donald Trump. But I want to go back uh, much further. I want to go back to something that happened to me uh, nearly two decades ago and suggest that there were some clues there in that experience to the world we're in now, so I want to take you back to courtroom 73 in the High Court, in the uh, Royal Courts of Justice there on the Strand. It's a very old building, uh, very grand. It looks almost like a sort of cathedral. But in courtroom 73 is a slight exception. It's actually one of the bigger courtrooms there and is very modern in its, uh, the way it's been appointed. In fact, when you go in there, it's all blonde wood tables. It looks as if someone's on a bin shop at Ikea. And, and that's the setting. And it's quite a contrast with the grandeur of the rest of the building. And the time I was there, which was just at the dawn of this century, just at the turn of the millennium, in the first few weeks of, uh, of 2000, there was quite a contrast between this extremely modern courtroom with all its laptops and blonde tables, blonde wood tables, and the subject matter, the talk in that room, which was actually dark and old. People in the courtroom when I was there, we're talking about what is, I think, in some ways, the darkest chapter of the 20th century. And there were lots of discussions about hatreds and loathings that were thousands of years old. And uh, if you haven't guessed yet, the reason I was there was I was covering the libel trial brought by David Irving against Deborah Lipstadt, the historian, uh, and Penguin Books. And David Irving, for people who lucky enough not to remember, uh, it is, is and was a writer who styled himself a historian, and he was suing Deborah Lipstadt for libel because she'd written a book saying that David Irving was a Holocaust denier, and he sued her for libel, uh, essentially arguing that there was, in essence, no Holocaust to deny. And he brought this case himself, and uh, it was quite a dramatic scene in there because you had Deborah Lipstadt and all of her lawyers, about 11 were there that day, uh, the f first day I went in there, among them Anthony Julius who had just, uh, just a few years earlier uh, acted in the divorce uh, case of Princess Diana, so very you know, esteemed lawyers, and on the other side in his pinstripe suit on his own was David Irving and it struck me, he was defending himself, he was acting for himself in the trial, and it struck me that that was exactly how he liked it, he wanted sort of David versus Goliath, and that's how he wanted the whole thing to be, to be arranged. I was there for several days, but they always used to follow this kind of pattern where the defense in the case, whose job really was essentially to prove that the Holocaust did happen, would come up, first of all, with evidence, say, from Holocaust survivors, uh, and they would show testimony and written evidence, and Irving would sit there and just wave it aside. He would just dismiss it all, saying, well, these people had obviously gone through something terrible. I don't know what it was, but they'd gone through something terrible and they were traumatized. And therefore, their uh, testimony is unreliable. Who knows? They were out of their minds with whatever had happened. So you have to just dismiss it all. And so the defense would say, all right, well, here is the evidence of the perpetrators of the Holocaust. Here, for example, is the transcript of the interview that Hans Almayer, who was the deputy commandant at Auschwitz, Here's his interrogation in 1945. And Irving would say, well, you can't believe a word of that because he was interrogated by British interrogation, British intelligence officers who just won the war. And as you know, and I remember he put on this sort of allo, allo accent, and he said, you know, as you know, we have ways of making you talk. He suggested that this was under duress. You couldn't believe, you couldn't accept a word of it. And then the defense would say, well, look at these photographs and documents that show about the buildings and here, Irving was in quite strong territory because he could say, well, the, uh, as, as was known, that the Nazis actually went to great pains to destroy the scene of the crime in uh, Treblinka and Sobibor and Chelmno, those death camps. 
And therefore, he said, you know, there's no way of knowing. We can't be certain. Uh, they would destroy completely in those places and partially destroyed at Auschwitz. So there's no way of knowing what use those places were put. And so finally, the defense came with all the rest of the documents. And they produced the requisition papers that showed orders of Zyklon B, the lethal gas that was used in the gas chambers, or architect's drawings, or minutes of meetings of top Nazis. And Irving would look at the piece of paper and he would put on his reading glasses and he would say, ah, but there's a serial number here where there's one number out of place. This must be a forgery. And then they would come up with another document and he would say, well, the margin is one millimeter further away than it should be. This too must be a forgery. And this went on for day after day. And then one day I'd been in the court for a long session and I came out and I was standing on the strand and middle of the afternoon and I had the strangest feeling, like this kind of feeling as if I was unsteady or even a little seasick. And it, as I took a step forward, it felt as if the ground beneath my feet was falling away. And it took me a while to understand that this was actually a physiological reaction that I was having to the world that Irving was describing. Because he was showing us a world where you could believe nothing, where you had no ground to stand on, where you couldn't take facts or proof or evidence and believe them um, because you had nothing to rely on. And I began to think, well, well, what would it be like to be in this world? How would you know that Henry VIII had six wives? How would you know that Napoleon fought the Battle of Waterloo? Well, any proof that was offered could be dismissed as a forgery or a, an exaggeration or a fake how would you know anything about the world we're in? How would you know that you know, the, your own birth certificate was real? How would you know anything? And it was a very queasy feeling I had that day. And uh, it stayed with me. Um, I'm going to get the stopwatch back up because that was very useful. Um, so that was a very disturbing feeling. And then I was lucky enough to be in court in April, a few months later, to hear the judge give his verdict and say Irving had lost. He'd lost his case, and the judge had decided that this man was a, not a historian at all. He was, in his words, a pro-Nazi polemicist. He made up, the, he doctored the historical record. You couldn't believe a word he said. The Holocaust was real, and this man was fake. And like everyone else, I left the courtroom relieved and pleased and felt this had been settled and put away. And yet, best part of 15 years later, I found that the old queasiness was coming back. And the first sign was around 2016 that the old queasiness was returning. You'll remember the bus with 350 million on the side of the bus. Well, that made me feel a little bit dizzy because the Office of National Statistics and the head of the UK Statistics Authority said that 350 million figure is wrong. And they expected the campaign to stop using it. And they didn't stop using it. And then there was Trump every day, literally every day, coming up with one, two, five, six provably false statements and he did it just last week just the other week day rather when he was here when he said you know I predicted Brexit I came here the day before the vote he said and I said that leave was going to win and he came the day after the vote he visited this country on June the 24th he went to Scotland to visit his golf course you can see the photographs you can see the news reports they're time stamped the video and he continues to say it right, in, in defiance of the evidence. And it's not just here and in America. You had Vladimir Putin saying that those people wearing Russian uniforms in Crimea, well, anybody can go to a fancy dress shop and buy a Russian uniform. They're not ours at all. And then nine months later, he's giving medals to those soldiers for their role and just with a kind of wolfish grin and a wink acknowledging what had happened. So Suddenly, this was all around us, and we had people talking in this new phrase of fake news, and we were in this world of post-truth, which is not the same as lies, by the way. Post-truth is something different. It's this kind of smirking disregard for the difference between truth and falsehood, and even a kind of casual acceptance that you might never be able to establish the truth, and it doesn't matter anyway. And that is different from just regular lying. And it's not just these bad actors, uh, the... Putin's or the Trump's who deliberately set about spreading these falsehoods or the fossil fuel companies who want to deny uh, climate change. It's part of the environment we've created for ourselves all around so that you have social media which prefers, it, its algorithms prefer virality to 
veracity. That's actually the way they're built. Uh, there's a paper in the journal Science which tested this and established that a false story travels further and faster than a true one. That something, there's something in us, and we'll need our previous speaker to explain exactly what it is in the brain that seems to feast on the false story and enjoy it more than the real one. So there's the social media part of our landscape as well as the people who mean us harm. But there's also something else going on in technology. And some of you may have seen a story, it was in the two, a couple of years ago in the Times, it was hailed as a great breakthrough that engineers, audio engineers in Edinburgh had managed to piece together a, as it were, recording, in quotes, of John F. Kennedy giving the speech in Dallas he was due to give but never gave because he was assassinated that day. And they had got the text, we'd always had the text, but they were able with machine learning and artificial intelligence to, and just co sophisticated computer software to put into the machine recordings of his voice and out came a, re a recording of him giving that speech. And everyone said, isn't this great? But I felt that queasiness again because I thought, what if somebody meant harm and made an artificial recording, you know, of Barack Obama saying, you know what, it's true, I really am a secret Marxist Muslim from Kenya and sounding like him in his own voice. And then there were the deep fake video technology. Uh, and this made a breakthrough, and often, by the way, this happens, the, the cutting edge often of internet technology is partly e-commerce, but also porn. And this happened first in the pornography industry where people started generating videos with the face of a celebrity grafted onto the body of a porn performer. I see a few nods of recognition from members of the audience. Um, <laughs> This new development uh, that was said that somehow you could fake video technology, and at first it was pretty hokey and jumpy, but now you have just last week a video of Nancy Pelosi, Speaker of the House of Representatives, in circulation in which her speech seems to be slurred, and actually they just slowed down the recording, but it's the video, and it's, but it's still there. And then, as if to show you what was possible, a group released a video of Mark Zuckerberg himself, head of Facebook, appearing to say that he is the creature of the Bond villain's spectre. But the point was it looked and sounded pretty convincing. Or you could, and I urge you to do it after uh, the talks rather than getting distracted with it now, you can go to a website called thispersondoesnotexist.com. That's not a link for the Dominic Raab Supporters Club. It's, <laughs> it's, instead, it's instead a website created by artificial intelligence engineers where Every time you click, it generates what seems to be a human face, but is actually not a human face. It's machine learned. Machines have learned how to simulate a human face. And at first, they looked really bad and, and rough at the edges, but they've got better and better at it. And now, I think it's really hard to tell the difference. So we're into a different environment now where we have politicians ready not just to lie, because, of course, politicians have always done that, but you have this smirking disregard, like I said, for the difference between truth and falsehood. This kind of, it doesn't matter anyway. You know, Don, uh, Donald Trump's favorite phrase is, nobody really knows, you know, nobody really knows what happened uh, with the Russia thing, you know, as if you can never establish the truth. So you have politicians doing that. You have a press which is, whose job is to expose lies when they happen, being dismissed as the lying press or the fake news by Trump, but also by others. And you have a technology which makes all this possible. And so the realization I've come to, and it's a, it's a giddy one, and an unsteady one, is that that feeling I had back in the year 2000, uh, that the Irving trial I now realize was in some ways the trailer, and we're all now living through the movie. That the techniques that he was showing, where you can just deny and deny and deny, that he was almost you know, previewing for the court in April 2000. Well, those are now all around us. It seemed ridiculous at the time, him sitting there dismissing every document that came before him. But now we have it. You, know, you have it when the White House press secretary says the crowds were bigger yesterday than they were eight years ago. And even though you can see the photograph saying that's not true, they say it anyway. The dismissal of evidence, whether it's climate change deniers or the anti-vaxxers denying the science. So, I began thinking, well, what if somebody did actually try and go even one stage further, not just to deny the historical record and the documents, but even to destroy them, to make sure they were eradicated and were never there? 
And then what if another figure, like the one I saw in the year 2000, stepped forward, perhaps not here but in America, to deny not the Holocaust but the, one of the <laughs> defining events of their national story? What if someone stepped forward and said, slavery never happened? and dismissed every proof, no matter how well documented. What if that happened? Well, the result of those two what-if questions to myself was this book, To Kill the Truth, but it only would have been possible, I only would have written it uh, because there is a war on truth. And the first step to fighting that war on truth is to realize that it's happening. Thank you very much.